Okay, I think we can start now. Melanie, take the chair. So good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone around the world. Welcome to the first session of MSG Academy Financial Literacy Series, the Financial Health Check session. So before we start, here are some house rules to follow. First of all, do remember to mute your microphones throughout the session to prevent disturbance for other participants. Turn on your webcam, and it is advisable to insert your questions in the Slido link provided in your email or the link in the chat box. Other than that, please be patient if there are any technical difficulties and we will try our best to resolve it as soon as possible. And lastly is to enjoy and learn. Another reminder for all participants is to rename yourself to your registered names to ease the registration process and for recording purposes in order for us to um, record for the certificate of participation. So without further ado, let us welcome the speaker for today. Next slide, please. Next slide. So today, let us invite Steve Lee, the Chief Learning Officer of Afin Huang Capital Management, Bahad. Just a brief introduction of our speaker today. He graduated from the University of Hawaii with a double major in finance and accounting and is a chartered financial analyst charter holder. He joined Afin Huang Asset Management in 2010 as Chief Product Officer. He set up an academy to cater to the learning and training needs of various clients after taking role as the Chief Learning Officer in 2014. He has 30 years of experience in portfolio management, marketing, and product development for the fund management. Um, previous slide. Stockbroking, onshore and offshore private banking industry. So the stage is yours, Mr. Steve. Hi, can everybody hear me loud and good? Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks for inviting me to talk uh, on this very important topic of uh, financial literacy. I think one of the um one of the shortcoming, I would should I say, or uh, shortcoming of our education system is I think from very young primary school. Uh, kindergarten, primary school, secondary school, or even to university, we were never taught a proper subject, taught a proper class about how to manage our money, how not to, how to identify a scam from a real deal, you know, uh, how to, you know, how to plan for basically our financial future. Okay, let me just share the screen first. Can see? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, why do I call this talk uh, financial health checks? Essentially, there are a few things that uh, it is like a it is like a, a checklist, you know. The when I go through the different aspect of financial uh, planning, okay, you guys can probably quietly check off the boxes if you have done so. If you have not, uh, it means there are certain area in financial planning or the financial well being or managing the personal finance financial affair or a person, whether it's a student or a uh, uh, a working person, uh, yeah, you, you check it off. These are all the all the areas that is going to concern us, whether now or in the future. Okay, uh, I think um, Melanie has already gone, gone through my experience. Uh, how I typically introduce myself regards to my experiences. 
I am my entire life I've been um working as um a financial person, basically counting counting other people's money. Uh, okay, whether it's from a stockbroking side or as a uh, product developer, okay, developing financial products for either the high net worth market or, or the mass market. Um, I've done fund management, you know, I manage other people's money. I have been an analyst before looking at uh, mainly on the equity side, looking at stocks. And I've also done private banking, the onshore and offshore side of things. So I have um, service, I've talked to high net worth individuals, I've talked to pension fund, I've talked to um, what else, uh, insurance company and all that. So I'm, I'm a money person, uh, pretty much money person, the entire spectrum of experience in the financial, in the finance industry. I think the only thing that I haven't really touched on is um, merger acquisition, corporate finance, um, debt capital market, that sort of things. Okay. The, the, so if you guys want to talk or you have question in regards to your career path or your career choice, uh, I'm sure some of you are finance major or accounting major, and you are probably wondering once I graduate, where would I want to branch out? Okay, is there a special area I want to focus on? I want to, you want to be a fund manager, an analyst, a private banker, or you want you want to be an auditor? I mean, you can talk to me because I, I've, I've done a lot of these kind of things and I can probably give you a, a flavor as to how is it like being a private equity manager? Something like that. Yeah. So the you can you can if you have question regards to your career in the finance industry, uh, you can also ask me. Um when I do the presentation, I usually don't look at the chat. Uh and I wouldn't know who is asking what. Uh when you have if you have a question, the feel free to interrupt me. Maybe just unmute yourself and ask. Um Verbally, would, would that be okay, guys? Yep, that would be fine. Yeah, okay. So today's topic, the financial literacy, um, five main areas. The first one is know where you are and where you want to go. Uh, control your budget, grow your assets, protect the precious. And lastly, I will just briefly touch on private retirement scheme, which is uh, launch in Malaysia in about, I think about close to 10 years ago. Okay. And uh, it had, th this particular segment is a supplement to our employment, uh, employee provider fund, EPF. Okay. But it's run privately. Um, the funds are managed privately by um, Malaysian fund managers. Okay. Just give me a short moment, okay. Okay. So our financial, personal financial affair, uh, I think just remember these four key terms. We gotta know, we need to control, we need to grow and we need to protect. Okay, uh, these, are, these are the main things. Okay, the stuff that I, I'm, I'll be talking today will be very, very commonsensical. A lot of us have heard about it. If you have read a um, dummy's guide to personal financial planning, or you have read an idiot guide to um, uh, financial planning, you know, the, the lot of stuff that I will be talking will, will sound very, very familiar. But uh, many of us, we may have read something, we have gone through it, or we have, we have bits and pieces of information or of financial planning, but um, I'm trying to put everything together. So as a youngster, as a uh, university student, um, you will be encountering all these things, okay? So when you, when, when you deal with it, when you see it, when you 
what, what are you going to do about it? Okay. So the first thing is no. Um, I'm not sure about you guys. I think because this is a Zoom meeting, it's very uh, cumbersome for me to ask for feedback. Um, but I've asked this question many times to uh, younger people or my colleagues, some are even older. Okay, I asked them, uh, do you know how much you're worth today? Most of them can tell me a ballpark, very, very vague number. Okay, I think very few can actually tell me down to the cents, okay, or roughly down to the down to the dollar as to how much they are worth, whether they are liquid or not liquid, okay. Uh, what is your debt to equity ratio? Okay, as in a person, what is your indebtedness ratio? Are you too highly geared as a person, or you are so conservative you don't you don't own a you don't owe a single cent? Okay, uh, for those who have or are majoring in finance, especially this this uh, this topic. Uh, this subject co about corporate finance, you deal with uh, things like, um, what is it? Uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it has been 30 years. I've forgotten the term. Um, weighted capital, okay? Weighted average uh, cost of capital, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, we, we talk about... Um, as a company, as a corporation, if you're too heavily indebted, it's not very healthy, okay? But if you are in a very capital intensive industry, for instance, steel, you're in a steel manufacturing in, uh, industry or you are in the telco where a company invests a lot on the infrastructure as in the base station for mobile transmission, mobile signal transmission, or you are in the, say the power generation uh, business. It is very, very common for such company to be very heavily indebted, sometimes to the tune of more than 100%. Uh, when I say more than 100%, I mean, you, 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 you just look at the balance sheet, you know, every dollar in the assets column, let's say on the cash side, how many percent of that one dollar is either borrowed or is it a form of capital? Okay, so in corporate finance, I think we we also learn if the company is too cash flush, it may not be um, or share price appreciative. It may not be share price enhancing because the market may perceive a company that um, is cash flush and not doing anything with the cash to be inefficient. Okay, so there is an optimal mix of uh, capital, whether it's borrowed or it is from the shareholders. Okay, so when you see, when you encounter a person that is totally cash and doesn't own a credit card, he doesn't have a housing loan, he doesn't have a car loan, he, he, everything he just paid with cash. Okay. That sounds very safe, right? But from a capital employment perspective, it may not necessarily be a good thing. It means the guy is just not, the company or that person is not utilizing uh, the power of leverage to get ahead of uh, other so-called other people or other competitions. Okay, let me just... So when I ask, I, I keep a balance sheet of myself, okay? I have my assets column, I have my current assets. Because I'm an accounting grad and also in finance, I did my uh, CFP, Certified Financial Planning uh, before. Then I did my CFA. That's why I'm very, very money person, okay? Uh, because of all this training, so very naturally when I look at my own personal finan financial affair, I treat it I treat myself as a company, it's like operating company. I have assets, I have cash, I have FDs, and I also have so-called the fixed assets. I have my cars, my, my properties, my, um, say, well, 
I haven't bought any the expensive artwork. I can't afford it yet. But you know, basically, fixed asset is not liquid. You can't just sell it within. You can't sell it off within a month. Say you were to sell a property, you will probably have to wait something like three months before you get your money. So those are like fixed assets. You know. Then on the liability column, you have your current liability, which would be, would, would be your credit card, credit card debt, right? When you when you charge your, your purchases to your card, you um you have at least you have to pay the minimum. You have a charge card, you have to pay everything on time. If not, uh, it will affect your credit scores and the banks will come after you, okay? And you also have a long-term liability as in your housing loan, your car loan, okay? You only pay the installment, but not the entire debt is due on uh, on a monthly basis, okay? Then if you take your current, uh, current assets plus your fixed assets minus your current liability and uh, long-term liability, you will have your net worth, okay? So I keep track of my personal finances in that in that sense. So at this particular point, I can tell you exactly down to the last dollar how much I'm worth. But for the purpose of this webinar, I would not be telling you that. Okay. So uh, you can guess. So what I'm trying to say is you, although you are a student right now, okay, you are just starting off with uh, in the uh, in the college or you are nearing completion of your program and you will be stepping into the, the working world pretty soon in the next couple of years or something like that, uh, you would have a balance sheet, okay? You need not necessarily be uh, empty because along the way, you may have worked part-time, you may have uh, inherited something from, from your parents, not inherited, I mean, you have gotten as a gift or whatever from your parents, so you would have some assets, okay? Even if you have a, a you have an iPhone, you have an iPad, that's that's your assets, you know, your, your laptop and all that kind of stuff. So you have to ask yourself where you are today, though you haven't started working yet, okay? But you should just take out a piece of paper. It's very simple for accounting students, you know, it's just too far. I'll show you the, the thing later. You must know where you are today. And when you retire, say at the age of 60, where you want to be, okay? We, when we call Grab, when we call Uber to get to the destination we want to go for something so simple, okay? When we, when we open the app, we will search for destination, okay? And the app would ultimately track where we are. We know exactly where to go, from where to where. But our personal financial journey uh, is very, very important uh, journey. I asked 10, I think probably nine and a half will tell me they have got absolutely no clue. Okay, so what I'm trying to do today is to probably urge you guys um, to take a look, take a hard look at yourself where you are today financially and where you are, where you want to be safe in five years, 10 years, uh, all the way to uh, 30, 35 years when you retire, okay? And only with a sense of direction as to where you are and where you want to go, can you plan it properly? You will decide if I, okay, I'm, I'm actually working part-time in a college cafeteria, I'm getting this uh, salary, usually minimum salary. If you are working out, if you're studying in Australia and, um, and Canada, very likely uh, you're allowed to work off campus. So your income is probably higher than say the, the American students, okay? Uh, Faris, you, you, can't, you can't work off campus in, in uh, Georgia, right? No, I'm not allowed to. Yeah, you're not allowed to. But the Canadian um, students and Australia, UK, I'm not so sure. I don't, they are, they are allowed to work off campus, okay? And uh, though their salary is not very high, but they are, um, they are getting a lot more than say the American students, okay? So your financial objectives is 
uh, why do you need to have a financial objective? Because ultimately, when you when you retire, you will be thinking of holiday abroad. You're thinking of maybe you want to set up a charity fund for the homeless people, for the stray animals, for or whatever cause that you care about. Okay, it could be for for the environment or uh, green, basically green uh, initiatives or anything. Uh, when you start a family, when you start having kids and all that, you'll be uh, thinking about your future. And uh, uh, those who are not under government scholarship, you probably know how expensive it is to pursue, say, just a bachelor's degree in uh, US, uh, Australia, and UK, all these countries, right? I mean, it's at least half a million and above. So if you if you want to send your kids uh, overseas, okay, and uh, you, you need to plan, okay, when as, you need to plan, especially the moment your kids hit 18 years old or 17, uh, school going age, very likely you are approaching, not really, not retired yet, but approaching the retirement age where you may not be so productive, okay. When I say so productive is, you may lose your job, okay? You may get uh, retired earlier than, than you wish. And I can tell you, a um, couple of my friends, they're not so lucky. I'm still uh, gainfully employed. Uh, they're not, not as lucky as me. They got laid off, say, at the age of um, maybe 52, 53. Okay, I'm 55 to this year. I've got five more years to statutory retirement age of uh, 60. So uh, I think within this five, five years, uh, if I don't do anything critically wrong, I think I should be uh, employed until I, I, I retire. But if in between, say at 49, 50, 51, 52, you got laid off for any reason and your kids are going to school, okay, and they need that money, uh, I can tell you it's extremely miserable. Why? Because when you are at that age, typically your salary will be quite high. Okay, your salary will be five figures um, with all sorts of perks and all that. Okay, most company, if they have got the reason to retire you and you're not productive anymore and your skill sets can be replaced by somebody younger and cheaper, uh, the chances is there that you can potentially lose your job when you need it the most to accumulate, uh, basically to, to have income to pay for your children's education. So children's education is a big thing, okay? Then uh, this morning I was uh, giving a webinar on retirement, uh, retirement planning. Uh, I actually formulated a spreadsheet to help um, the participants step by steps to go through uh, the entire process to determine how much they need to retire is a little bit more detailed than just uh, a simple calculation of your last drawn uh, sorry your last expense divide by divide by the let's say the FD rates you know to know how much you need to accumulate in order to give you a sustainable monthly uh, returns to sustain the, the post-retirement lifestyle, okay? So your financial objective, what, what do you want to do, you know? What's your, what's your lifelong dream? Uh, well, the, those who, I mean, Jack Ma has got a very famous saying, you know, Jack Ma of Alibaba fame, okay? Jack Ma has got a, a very famous saying. He says, um, money is actually not that important, okay? For somebody as rich as him to be saying uh, things like this, I've lost quite a bit of respect for this guy, <laughs> okay? Because, come on, you have got billions. Of course, you can say whatever you want, okay? But I haven't made my money. Money is important. And... Uh, uh, why am I talking to you today is um, I, I think every single one of you should manage your finances to the extent that you reach some sort of financial freedom in, uh, in the future so that you can do what you want to do 
not what you have to do. That's very, very important. Okay. I'm sure many of you are uh, pursuing the study of your choice, but some may not be pursuing the study of your choice. You're doing it because it's practical, that it's going to get you a good job. Okay. But ultimately, I think your objective in life should be uh, to be able to do the things that you truly like to do, not something that you have to do. Okay. The only way to maintain a, some sort of dignity uh, is to essentially not have to work for the money, but to get the money to work for you. Okay. That means you are well qualified enough that people are willing to pay you top dollars for your skills, for your skill sets, for your brains, for your knowledge, to the extent that uh, you can, you are you're only in the so-called the buyer's market. Like you are the buyers and there are a lot of sellers uh, who is demanding for your skills. Okay. Okay, before I move on, I just want to ask this question. How much is enough when you are no longer productive. Essentially, what I'm saying here is uh, I'm referring to the retirement bit of things. I know you're not thinking about retirement. It's just too early to be thinking about retirement. But I will tell you why you have to think about retirement right now because the time, because time is on your side. You are very, very young. If you start planning, if you start accumulating, you start some sort of investment plan today, Okay, by the time you hit 60, you will be sitting on a few million at least as a buffer for your retirement. Okay, and not by, you, you will have a few million not um, by not doing anything um, uh, very drastic. You know, essentially, essentially just follow the investment plan, investing your assets, investing your income into something that is going to grow over the long run and let the power of compounding help you to get to the few million or more than more than few million uh, when you retire, okay? And there is no rocket science, it's just time value or money. You know, you just have to take out your financial calculator, punch in the numbers, you'll be able to see it already, okay? So how much is enough when you're no longer productive? I'll just give you an example. You probably cannot picture it very well right now because you're still a student. But for, a, for somebody that has uh, come out to work, you know, <clears throat> in the industry, say you are, your money expense is 1,000 per month, okay? So when you retire, 1,000 times 12 divided by three, of course, it's not three anymore. Three is a fixed deposit rate uh, about one, two years ago. Now it's 1.6. We're just using this as, uh, for, for illustration. For every 1,000 of your monthly expense now, okay, this is a very crude calculation. My, the, what I did this morning was a lot more accurate because it, it accounts for inflation, it accounts for um, uh, rising, basically rising money, uh, monthly expenses. And all that. For every 1,000, you need 400,000 sitting there, not including your housing, not including your house, not including your cars, not including of anything that is not income generative. Okay, so I'm talking about cash, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, things that are liquid, that are actually producing uh, some kind of return for your retirement. So you just imagine uh, 5,000, 5K ringgit sort of lifestyle is really no big deal, okay? It's, I'm telling you, I'm living a lifestyle that's uh, at least a, a few times of this 5,000 uh, ringgit kind of lifestyle. But for a 5,000 lifestyle, you times four, 400,000, you need 2 million cash sitting in your account when you reach the age of 60. If not, the moment you cross 60s and you go into retirement, your, life, uh, your lifestyle, your standard of living will start declining because you just don't have enough to sustain what you used to enjoy uh, when you're working, okay? So this is a very, very simple yardstick. If you're living a 10,000 lifestyle, you know you will, need, uh, you will need 4 million in your account when you reach uh, 60, okay? 
So we are still on this topic, know where you are, okay? Uh, take a snapshot of this. Uh, if you are not an accounting student, you are not a finance student, this is probably foreign to you. So you have your liquid assets, you have your cash, your fixed deposits, your, uh, of course, some of nowadays, uh, some of your money is actually pumped in the e-wallet, you know, your stocks investment, your, your mutual fund, your fixed assets, whether you have a car, you have a house, anything that's fixed. Anything that is fixed that has got a little bit of value in case you need it, you can do a garage sales. Okay, garage sales is not a is, is not an in thing, it's not a common thing over here. Uh Faris, you 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 can probably relate uh, in Georgia. Uh when a family wants to move away, they don't want to carry everything. Uh, they will do a garage sales. Sometimes they will do a garage sales just to get rid of the junks. Okay, they will open their garage, whatever they need to sell, they just they just chuck it into a garage or sometimes on the pavement for anybody to drive past and say, hey, you know, I think this rice cooker is still looking good. Uh, it's still in pretty good shape. Um, can you sell it for five, five bucks? You know, something like that. So unless it's something that you can at least do it with uh, get rid of in the garage sales. Otherwise, it's pointless to include it in this particular statement. Okay, it must be something of value. Then the, on the liability side, your car loan, housing loan, these are all long terms, uh, long terms liability. Then you have your shorter term one will be your credit card, charge cards, bills, your personal loan, or if you owe your friend money, I think it should be long here unless you have no intention to pay back. Okay, then you would not be a liability. Okay, so you take all your assets, you minus all your liability, that's essentially uh, what your net worth is. Okay, everybody has got a net worth, whether it's big or small. Okay, if you're Jack Bezos, you're Bill Gates and all that, this particular column here will be some astronomical, astronomical number in the billions. Okay, what does net worth actually mean? Net worth actually means when you're not around, okay, uh, touch wood, if something happens to you and you meet God, okay, your, so the surviving member of your family would be inheriting this net worth. They will have to take over your assets, pay off all your debt, and this is exactly what they get. That's the meaning of net worth, okay? I mean, it's, it's my, my meaning of net worth. Okay. Um, so do something like this for yourself. Try to see where you stand. Because without knowing where you are, it's very, very difficult to determine where you want to go, okay? So after you've done that, uh, the balance sheet, do an income statement for yourself. Uh, this is basically monthly, weekly, or whatever budget thing. So if you're a student right now, you probably don't have a lot of income. You probably don't have a primary income yet, but you have a little bit of secondary where you moonlight as a uh, librarian, you, you go and uh, work in a ca uh, cafe, uh, or you, you work in uh, McDonald's or KFCs or, or Pizza Hut uh, in, in, in Melbourne or Sydney or or some American or Canadian cities, okay? So you will have your income. It may not be stable. It may not be something constant. Uh, some certain weeks you work 20 hours, certain weeks you work uh, 25, 30 and whatever, okay? Then you take out all your expenses, okay? This is more applicable to somebody who has come out to the, to the workforce, who is starting to work, you have a, primary salary that's pretty much fixed. Then secondary, maybe you have a hobby, you like to bake cakes, you sell cakes uh, over the internet, or you know how to, you, you have a hobby of making knickknacks, uh, clay animals or whatever, you know, that you're very good at it and you are selling it on the internet um, or for pocket money. Okay, that will be your secondary income. So after you paid off all your rents and all your expenses, everything, okay, including entertainment, uh, say you like to go clubbing, you like to uh, uh, hang out on the weekends with friends, and these are all, all these should be uh, taken into account. 
And I just need you to remember this, this term access, okay? When you're working, when you do have an income statement or profit and loss statement in the UK, UK they call it profit and loss statement, in US they call it income statement. Okay, when you do this particular budget for yourself and every month is a negative down here of a deficit, okay, you need to do something about it, okay? Uh, why? Because without access, you would not be able to do a some sort of investment plan to ensure you know, your plan, your investment grow into something that you can retire with. Okay. If this is constantly negative, whether it's in the form of a credit card debt or a personal loan or uh, whatever, whatever form of liability, okay, um, resulting in deficit after deficit every month, okay, uh, you need to look at your primary source of income, secondary, can you boost it or not? Can you bring this up? After that, you have to look at the bottom. Can you reduce it? Can you lower a rung in terms of your uh, standard of living? Can you be a bit more thrifty? Uh, instead of driving, say, a, uh, I'm talking about US cents, uh, you, uh, instead of driving a 30,000 car, can you drive a 15,000 car? Okay, and, and paying a, a smaller loan. Um, you're staying in a you're staying alone in an apartment right now, okay, and you are paying a thousand bucks. Can you share the room with another guy and pay five hundred? You probably have to do that, okay. If not, you don't have access down here. Um, yeah, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be miserable when when you retire. Of course, along the way, as you accumulate more uh, more experience, your salary is gonna go up, okay. But when your salary goes up, I can assure you, your lifestyle will be improved. You will be asking for more. You used to drive a Honda Civic, now you want a BMW. After you're getting a BMW, you're looking at a Porsche, right? I mean, the hum human needs, uh, human needs is uh, essentially in insatiable. So you would be looking to upgrade your lifestyle as and when you get a pay rise or you get a fat bonus uh, in a certain years. Okay. Uh, one way, in fact, the smarter way is not to increase, not to improve your lifestyle or the living expenses, even if you've got, you have extra due to uh, a pay rise or a bonus, because all this should go into your investment plan to put less pressure into the, into the future. Okay to generate the required sum for your retirement, okay? So remember this, access. So how access can build your net worth is a very, very commonsensical thing, but uh, I'm just trying to do it more graphically so that you can see how do you increase a net worth, this particular column down here. Essentially, you need to increase your assets and decrease your liability is as simple as that, okay? Even if you are very, very rich, okay? Say you are from a very rich family, there is a very, very good chance that your assets are not managed optimally. That's why we have to look at this statement, list down all our assets and look at and stare at the cash. See, after you have done this, you realize your cash is like 80% of your net worth. Then you gotta start asking yourself, really, am I too conservative or not? Okay, when this particular column here, the liability is huge, you know, it's like it is like for your every net worth, every cent here, out of it, the 80% is coming from here, you know. Then you gotta ask yourself, am I too highly geared? Because I'm I keep paying interest and I don't have I don't have extra to build my assets column here, right? Okay. So the, the, even if you have a lot of money, the, um, like we consult our client, I used to be a private banker in Singapore with Credit Suisse uh, and later BNB and P Paribas, uh, the Swiss bank and the French bank. Um, I deal with uh, very, very, very rich people, okay? I think out of my 20, uh, out of my 30 clients, at least about five to 10 of them are public listed company bosses, okay? 
I've flown first class, I have dined in the most expensive restaurants, uh, I've done all these things, okay, um, and I know how they think. When I talk to them, they are like, um, most of them will say, uh, Steve, could you just give me about 200% above, uh, 200 basis point above treasury sort of return, I'm very happy already. Um, don't give me 15, 20% sort of return, it's too risky, you know. The return is good, but that means I would have to subject my investment to something uh, a lot riskier, okay. So the rich people, they could be rich, but their assets are generally not optimally deployed or managed, okay. So you know where you are, you know where you want to go. Okay, I, I, the, where you want to go, I'll probably cover it very briefly later because you're just too young to think about uh, uh, retirement. But you roughly, you know, if you are a, if you are, if you are spending about 5,000 today, okay, ringgit, let's talk ringgit. If you're spending 5,000 today, very likely uh, you need at least about 2 million uh, to retire. Yeah, period. It's, it's that simple. Okay. Then uh, you also need to know your risk profile and I need to split risk profile into tolerance and capability. Okay. Um, and they are very, very different things. Okay. A lot of people look at uh, when, you, when you walk into a stockbroker's office, you want to open an account, you have to fill out the KYC, know your capital know your customer's uh, uh, questionnaire, okay? The stockbroker or the bank manager will need to know your profile, your risk profile so that they can recommend um, investment that are, you know, uh, com basically commensurate with your, 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 your risk profile. But they typically just mention risk profile, which is not the full picture, okay? The full picture is risk tolerance and risk capability. I just give you two, uh, a few examples, uh, and then you will know where you are, where you stand. I grew up. My parents. Okay, this is just example. My both of my parents are teachers. Okay, they are university professor. The other one is a high school teacher. From young, they taught me to be thrifty, to be careful with our money. They are just very very conservative people. Okay. Um, then, um, uh, just a moment, let me kill this call. Uh, I mean, the uh, webinar, uh, bro. I call you back. Okay, yeah. okay, Sorry. Okay, so I, I'm from that kind of background, right? So they are very, very thrifty, very simple people. So naturally, if I'm brought up, being brought up in that sort of environment, my risk tolerance is actually quite low, okay? When the, my friend invite me to Genting Highland, you know, they like to gamble this, gamble that, they buy 4Ds, I typically would not touch this kind of stuff. That means naturally when I'm born or brought up in an environment where I avoid risk, I would like to um, work very hard to get a good degree, you know, get a good job, a very, very stable job with uh, maybe a consulting consulting firm, work my way up the corporate ladder, uh, retire to be a managing partner or a partner of a consulting firm or something like that, you know. Those are people who have got very uh, low risk tolerance versus another person, another me, uh, from young, I grew up uh, in a businessman family. My family um, has been into all sorts of businesses. They have started, say, five businesses, out of which uh, three has failed. The other two has thrived, okay? That's where I am. And in my career, sorry, when I was growing up, my childhood, there were, there were periods where my parents, um, certain periods, they were very gloomy because the... the um, uh, my father's business wasn't doing well during that time and he needed uh, working capital. He needs to borrow money from the relatives. He needs to go to the bank and back the bank managers. 
But the moment he hit, he hits it, he hits it real big. Okay. So big that, uh, you know, among my peers, I'm probably the, one of the very few at a very, very tender age who was really being chauffeured, driven by somebody, you know, uh, to school, you know, something like that. So if I grow up in that kind of environment, pretty likely I'm a risk taker. Okay. My parents taught me, hey, in life, you just have to take risks. Otherwise, uh, it is not a life uh, worth, li worth living, you know. So that's tolerance. That's what you can, how you were brought up, your background, your training, and you know, that kind of stuff. That you become somebody like that, okay. But risk capability has got very little with, to do with uh, tolerance. If I'm 25 years old, I, I'm choosing an investment for myself, you know, to accumulate for a long run, okay. My risk capability is extremely, extremely high. I should be in hedge fund. I should be investing in small cap funds. Whatever that has got a higher risk that is going to give me the highest return possible. I should be in that sort of investment. Not some FD and bond fund or income fund. You know, that sort of things. Okay, I should be looking at maybe a nuclear power ETF. I should be looking at probably an agricultural e sector ETF uh, listed on American Stock Exchange or something like that. You know, why? Because if I fall, I can always pick myself up and go. Okay. And I'm not asking you to take out a million and just plow into some kind of investment. I'm talking about if every month I would have fork out, I would have contribute to an investment plan of 500 ringgit a month, this extra, the excess that I was talking about, how much can my 500 ringgit grow to in 30 years if I would religiously set aside 500, I automate the deduction from my, my salary slip, my salary account, okay, to invest in this thing without, uh, without bothering anybody. Basically, it's automation. Uh, either via a standing in instruction or you can give a some sort of instruction from, to the uh, mutual fund company to deduct from certain bank account, a certain sum at a certain time, a uh, certain date of the month, okay? So that you can automatically investing in something that you think is going to grow over a long run, okay? So that is risk capability. This to, um, today I'm 55, five more years to retirement. I'm not sure if my boss will continue to hire me. So my risk capability, okay, I may have millions, you know, but my risk capability is actually very low. If I fall, okay, let's say I've got 5 million. I plow this 5 million into one concept, okay, that I think is very promising. And if the promises doesn't come, the promises, promises don't come, okay, I have very little time to fight back. So, According to your age, your risk capability will be very, very different. Faris, your risk capability is super high. My risk capability is super low. S simple as that. Okay. So you need to know this. You, you, you as a person, you have to. So for somebody as young as you to be putting all the all your money in um, in fixed deposits, in bond fund, in all the instruments, investment instruments that's going to, just going to yield you, uh, you know, 2 to 5%. You, you are basically doing a, dis, a disservice to your, to your own financial affair, okay? Because S&P 500, I will show you the chart later, okay? So I know my, I know where I am. I know where I want to go, okay? Then I got to start planning how do I accumulate to, to get there. I already know my risk profile. So at a very, very tender age right now, I should know the appropriate level of risk I should take. If you're taking too little risk at this age, you are not doing yourself a favor because you have got a lot of time to accumulate and you, you can split the entry point into uh, 240 or 360 every month, you know, entry point. So essentially for you to be investing in something very risky and very high risk, by virtue of you splitting into a monthly monthly investment would have mitigated most of the risk away already. 
quickly. So after this, after know your, your financial position, you need to start controlling. Okay, um, when I was in my 20s, I was quite active socially. So I go out, go out to drinks with my friends. And you know, those days, uh, I still remember my first uh, starting salary was 1,003. That was 30 years ago. 1,003 ringgit here. It's also 1,003 ringgit in US. I used to work in Honolulu. My starting pay was 1,003. I mean, that's, that's quite, a, quite a long time ago. I'm sure it's higher right now. Okay. Um, so, um, I, I always spent every month I had, uh, I had deficit. So my typical, for at least the first three years of my life, uh, my working life, uh, every year end when I get my bonus, it goes towards settling my credit card account. I will accumulate during the, during the year. Sometimes I would, uh, let it roll, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. And you accumulate to a humongous sum. I mean, humongous to me those days, okay? Humongous sum. Then when I get my bonus, I don't get to enjoy my bonus. My bonus goes towards settling the entire credit card uh, outstanding. Because if I don't settle, I, you will just continue the snowballing to some, uh, some ridiculous numbers. So, uh, to the extent that, um, yeah, you, you know, credit cards, you're paying 18% interest uh, for whatever outstanding you, you don't settle. So you need to control your budget. This is very, very important. And after a while, I realized it, I started implementing some sort of uh, system to my, to, my, um, to my budgeting. Okay, this is probably outdated. Uh, when you control your budget, I used to, when e-wallet wasn't very popular, I used to go to the uh, ATM on payday when my salary is in. I will take out cash. Uh, let's say I'll take out the, uh, let's say my monthly pocket money is 2000. Okay. I will go to the ATM, withdraw the 2000 one shot, put the 2000 in, the, in, my, in my drawer. And every Monday, I will take out 500 bucks from the drawer chuck it into my wallet. And from Monday to the Sunday, that is my budget, the 500. If Monday, Tuesday, I tahan, you know, nothing happened. I, I, I continue to uh, spend, but spend very, uh, very, very carefully. But on a Wednesday, some high, somehow is a ladies night or whatever, I go clubbing. I blew that 500, I blew, um, Say I blew out of the 500, Monday I use, uh, I use 20 bucks, Tuesday I use 20 bucks, right? So I still have 460, right? But on, the, on Wednesday, because of some, some, some clubbing uh, activities, I blew say 300. So I'm, I'm left with very little, you know? I'm, I'm left with only 140, right? Yeah, sorry, 160, 160 to last me Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So for the rest of the week, you know what I have to do? Every day I'll be on nasi lemak kosong, you know, stable diet, right? Because if you were to use everything up during the week, then you dig into your uh, kitty, you dig into your wallet to take out the second 500, okay? You are actually spending future money really. You're spending next week's allocation, okay? And that, that's very, very dangerous because you keep on doing this forever, you would not have an access in your account. Uh, you cannot participate in some sort of investment plan, investment scheme or saving scheme, okay? And when I talk scheme, I'm talking about our own scheme, or we devise our own scheme, okay? So what, what do I do now? Uh, in, in fact, it is such a, it's such a good discipline uh, that if you can save Monday, Tuesday, Friday, Thursday, okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and on a Friday, you know you have 500 for the week and you, 
you only use up 10, uh, uh, say 100. Every day from Monday to Friday, you only use up 20, 20 or 100, right? So for the remaining Saturday and Sunday, you have 200 each. Uh, you can do wonders, you know, you can reward yourself. Buy yourself a nice shirt or, you know, uh, buy your buy your friends a nice meal, go, go, for a, go for a concert, you know, something like that. Okay, this is financial discipline mentally. When you have that sort of mental uh, discipline, you will enjoy, when you spend the money, you will enjoy, you say, hey, I, this, is, this is really, really, it doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. It, do, it does not matter. Okay, the humblest people are the richest. Some of those, uh, some of those richest people, they are the humblest and the more, more uh, the, the thriftiest people. Okay. If you are from a very, very rich family and you don't need to live like that, um, uh, I got nothing to say. Like, you're not my you're not my target audience. <laughs> my target audience is the masses. We are not uh, born with the silver spoon. We have to work our way, way up. You know, we have to deal with uh, all these things. And I take it as a challenge. Uh, I'd rather be common. I'd rather be common like everybody else. I go through the grind. I think I will value what I have a lot more than somebody with uh, born with 100 million. And, uh, you, you know, they, they, when they turn 18, the first thing there is a, there is a sports car. Uh, they, they get a sports car as, as their 18-year-old uh, birthday gift. You, you know, something like that. I, that would not be my target market. I think they have a different sets of uh, financial planning uh, discipline. So for those people who are born with the silver spoon, they are, what do you call it? To them, they are forever thinking of how to utilize the existing pool of money they have to make more, okay? To, to, invest, to invest in certain business, to invest in a private equity deal, you know, that, that, are so, that sort of things, you know, to uh, maybe buy some properties, collect rent. Yeah, that, that is um, beyond the scope of today's uh, discussion, okay? Today I'm talking about ordinary people with ordinary budget, okay? Yeah, now e-wallets, very, very popular. I love to use my touch and go. I love to use my grab pay and all that kind of stuff. How do you, control your budget with e-wallet. Same thing. Instead of taking out 2,000 cash now, I take out 1,000 cash. I reload 500 into touch and go. I reload 500 into, uh, into grab pay. I use it like normal. So when I see my touch and go, uh, uh, so-called the balance uh, uh, dwindling, I know I, I have to, I have to spend less already. If I look at Grab, you know, the balance is declining very quickly. I, I just have to uh, basically uh, spend less. Then the 1,000, I split it into four. Every week, I just take up 250. Because the other 250, I'm, I'm deducting from, I'm using uh, my, my e-wallet to pay. Okay. Don't, uh, don't underestimate this, this uh, budget thing uh, because how many of you can tell me very honestly you can budget so well that you never overspend? Every month you want to contribute 500 or you want to contribute 200 into your investment plan, you would have it. You don't have to borrow uh, from friends or you don't have to cheat yourself. You have to, you don't have to cheat yourself. This month I'm supposed to put 500 in, but because I overspend, I'm putting, I'm only investing 200, okay? Then you're cheating yourself already. And I will show you later with the uh, compound, uh, future value of uh, compounding, how powerful it is. I mean, you you probably already know if you're accounting students, so, okay? It's no big deal. That, <laughs> Good debt, bad debt, okay? If you're a corporation, you also have to deal with good debt and bad debt. If, I, if I'm very successful in a business, I list the company, the company got listed, you know, I got, I got a lot of windfall. The first thing I do is, and I'll, I buy a fleet of 10 Mercedes for all my directors and senior managers. 
that sort of company you probably won't want to invest lah. okay they they don't know where the so-called the priority is you should improve the welfare of your of your employee you should be investing in r d you should be investing in uh, operation and method to make sure your manufacturing production uh, line is tip top you should be investing in education of your staff of your employee to make them more productive rather than buying a fleet of depreciating assets and just looking good okay so likewise if you're about if you're spending a lot of money buying a nice car that you can't afford okay you uh you take personal loan from banks they like to offer personal loans uh, to uh, individuals like you and me okay and they will tell you the interest rate is actually very low it's only about three percent or four percent okay ask them a follow-up question three four percent flat right is not monthly declining or or yearly declining balance three four percent flat is as good as effective rate seven to seven to nine percent okay so you better be very very careful about all these things Auto loan, same thing, is also flat rate. Credit card, you know, is 18%. You, you, you're, you're, you're being charged 18% on the balance that you, uh, you don't settle, you don't fully pay. Cash advance, okay, every time you take out cash advance from your credit card, you're down 5%. They whack you a 5% fee, if I'm not mistaken. 2 or 5%, I, I can't remember. Okay, payday loan is essentially a personal loan, okay. You can also take out a good debt, a student loan, to get your education because it is going to increase your earning power. You buy a real estate that's going to appreciate in uh, over time. You know, mortgage real estate is the same thing. You take up debt to invest. This is uh, this is a little bit more uh, a, a bit riskier. You have to be careful with that. Okay, uh, taking out debt to buy into stocks is called margin financing. Margin financing can make you very rich and it can kill you overnight also, okay? Essentially, you're borrowing money that don't belong to you, put it into, let's say, a speculative stocks. Okay, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's dangerous. Um, you borrow money to invest in a business, say you want to open a burger joint, you want to open a, um, our career, you know, you want to take, take up a franchise, you know, something like that, a bubble tea franchise or something like that. As long as your business does well, okay, you are fine. Okay, if your business is not doing well, then too bad. So you look at this column versus this column, all these are productive. You borrow money to invest in something productive, you will generate more money. Over here, everything you incur the debt is depreciating. You are investing in depreciating assets. Uh, asset that's why it's called uh, bad debt, All right? Okay. So you need to control. What did I say? You need to control your budget. You need to control your debt. You need to control your lifestyle. Okay. Uh, I actually formulated this sentence. I mean, initially I thought it sounded quite alright. If you live beyond your means, you will be mean living beyond. Okay. You will look very mean. Everybody hates you because. You keep going, going to them to borrow money, okay? Because you, you just, whatever you have, whatever you're earning are just not enough to sustain your lavish lifestyle, okay? You need to control your lifestyle. But if you are born with 100 million uh, inheritance, uh, I have nothing to say. I mean, you are a different category, okay? Uh, personally, I, I, I live by this motto, true friends don't judge you for what you have, but who you are, right, okay? So if the friend is judging you for what you have, lose him as a friend. He, he does not add any value to your life. Okay, as simple as that. Uh, Mr. Steve, I think one of our audiences has a question. Yeah, That's sure. me. Yeah. Do you want to pose that question? Yeah, please. You can type it in. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading it. If you are not comfortable speaking up, We'll give Najmi about 20 seconds. Okay. 
Okay, the question just popped up. Yeah. I don't see anything yet. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. He direct messaged me. Um, oh. He asked if we use credit card to yeah. collect credit score. Yeah, I think it's absolutely fine. Okay. You know, credit, credit card, there is a interest-free period when you charge the card. Okay, let's say you're billing, uh, let's make it simple. Your billing, your billing date is end of the month, or let's say 30th, uh, on the 30th. So if you use your credit card from uh gen from the first to the 30th, okay, uh say on the 29th, you you swipe your card to buy something, but it has not the it has not been posted to your account as that means the merchant has not submitted um the the expense i mean the, that purchase to the credit card company okay and it does not appear in your credit card statement on the 30th then that particular purchase will be interest free for another month until the next uh, due date or uh, another month so there is a so called uh interest free period that you can use that to your advantage but when you use a credit card, you have to assign a limit to yourself, not a limit assigned by the credit card company, which is usually very huge, right? You have to assign a limit because if not, you would be, um, um, you, you will lose track of how much you spend and in the end, your budget will be, will be haywire, okay? So you need to know, you already know you have the budget for the laptop, and you're using the credit card to, uh, to buy the laptop to either accumulate points or take advantage of that interest-free window, okay, you can do that. But you must absolutely, you have to be extremely disciplined to control the balance and you need to settle it every month. Don't leave a balance there. It's a ridiculously expensive, okay? In fact, it's cheaper to go and get a personal loan uh, then uh, using the credit card and not settle the, the entire sum and leave a balance there, okay? Um, did I answer your question? Uh, Lashmi, is it? Okay, uh, I, Adila, Adila, in the world of mismatch in pay and purchasing power is difficult enough to survive. Living in a city, what more to say for tomorrow? Any, any advice for us? I totally understand what you're saying. Okay. I totally understand what you're saying. Um, it is also unfortunate that we are in, a, in, in this era where Inflation is sort of on a high side, okay? I used to be able to get a noodle, a bowl of noodle for, you know, my nasi lemak used to cost me only five bucks. Now easily, if I just add a sotong, you know, it's, uh, yeah, especially you go to the nasi kanda stall, you end up with a 20, 20, 20 ringgit or 30 ringgit plate of, uh, plate of nasi kanda. It's, it's abs absolutely crazy, you know? So um, you have just, you go back to my income statement just now. You just have to figure out a way <clears throat> to increase your earnings. Pick up a hobby, <clears throat> perfect a hobby, be very good at it, <clears throat> and sell your skills. And sell your products, <clears throat> okay? If your current job is not paying your bills, okay, something is not right. Either you have to you, you have to maybe share a room or you have to reduce your uh, so-called expenses. I know it is easier said than done. I agree with you. You don't have to... Uh, Adila, I don't have to talk to you. I really know what you're going to say already because it's a, very, it's a very, very common problem, okay? Especially living in a big city like KL, 
uh, if you are in Melbourne, you are in Sydney, you are in uh, LA, San Francisco, and all that. It's all very, very, uh, very expensive. Okay, so you just have to think of a way to earn, either take up a additional qualification, or maybe you may have to moonlight a little bit. Okay, you may have to moonlight uh, maybe as a uh, maybe do some delivery for people or offer to do part time for something. No choice, lah. This is this is the world we are living in today. My generation, I had it a bit easier than you. I'm a Gen X. I was born in 1965. I graduated in 90. I came back. The Malaysian economy was. I, I used to work in Honolulu, and I used to work in Singapore. Uh, but most of the time, I work in Malaysia. Uh, during my time, the, whatever we earn, we still have enough to spend. I think the mismatch of pay and purchasing power is very real in a big city in Malaysia. Okay, uh, and you, unfortunately, I'm not a finance minister. I can't change things. <laughs> okay, I can only change myself. I can change my own habit. I can change my, I can try to improve my earnings power. If all else fail, you may have to consider moving into a smaller town, a cheaper town, and try to make a life in, uh, in those uh, uh, maybe cheaper places. But that would not be your asp uh, aspiration. Of course, you want to stay in a big city, um, you know, get the exposure and um, uh, get the experience and exposure so that you can earn more in the future. Um, I'm just hoping that uh, maybe your parents or your friends or whatever in time of trouble, they can help you tie over the period so that when you go out to work and when, before you get your pay rise and all that, somebody to help you to tie, uh, tie over the tough period. If nobody is going to help you, you probably you will have to figure out a way to help yourself. Uh, and the easiest way to do is to basically lower your standard of living. Um, basically, don't, don't, don't spend too much on unnecessary things. Just focus on the necessary thing first. Slock out for three, five years. Have some savings, okay? Then, um, then you, you will be okay. I mean, we are, we are born to fight, okay? <laughs> so fight on, yeah. I don't think, I don't think I have... Uh, a very crips, a very complete answer for you because it is not your problem. It is everybody's problem, uh, especially uh, urbanized. Uh, you go to San Francisco, uh, pardon my language, uh, San Francisco is known to be the shit city, okay? Because everywhere you can see human droppings, human, uh, human waste, you know, it has got the highest homeless rate uh, probably in the world. You know, uh, I've been there. I happened to stumble upon the walk in a walk in a downtown, and I the the scene, the sight that I saw was not uh, was not consistent to San Francisco as and uh, Silicon Valley as the tech hub of the world. Okay, it has got one of the highest GDP per capita, highest uh, uh, average pay, okay, but also has got the highest living expense, uh, the most expensive property in uh, rental, rental rate in the whole US. Okay, so that is driving a lot of people, especially those who have lost a job in the IT sector, okay, to basically go on, go on to the street. They just cannot afford the rental, okay. So if you think we are bad here, there are a lot worse uh, places like Paris, um, you know, the, the American cities, um, even, I, I only know this, this cover. I think Australia is, is, is quite all right. You know, the minimum wage is quite high. So as long as you get a, even a cafe job, you know, uh, working in a cafe, working in a restaurant, you're you are fine. Okay. I think likewise with UK as well. But US and, 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 and France is uh, slightly different. Somehow they are, they are <laughs> the, the social structure is a little bit different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's three. How much time 
Do I have a uh, Boris? You have until 3.45 to oh, present. Boy. Okay, I got to fly, okay? okay <laughs> I need no to worries. fly. Yeah. So control your lifestyle, look at Bill Gates, look at Mark Zuckerberg. Um, okay, this statement here, wearing unbranded and cheap clothes does, doesn't mean you are poor. Remember, you have a family, a family to feed, not the community to impress. Apparently, Mark Zuckerberg wears branded uh, the gray shirt. Uh. His gray shirts are actually quite expensive and he, he wears only one type. Okay, but I'm sure the Bill Gates, uh, there are a lot of uh, rich people, uh, they don't really care. If you have billions or even if you have millions in your, in your bank account, you don't have to impress other people. You know, you, you, you basically, your, your priority in life is very, very different. Really. Okay. Okay, control your cost of debt. It is okay to borrow as long as your return on investment, okay, in percentage is higher than your cost of debt. So debt is not bad. You cannot look at that and be fearful and say, hey, all rich people, including Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, all, they borrow to the hill. Why? Because cost of fund is so low in the, in the developed world. You can get a loan for 2%, you know, in US. And if I can invest in something that's going to yield me 5 to 10%, why not? I have a positive carry of 7, 8%. You know, I can borrow as much as I want and just make the difference, you know. Okay, this is what we call positive carry. The return on investment is higher than your cost of debt. You get a positive carry. When you have a negative carry, it's your cost of debt is higher than your return investment. Of course, when you talk about investment, there is a chance of failure. Okay, your, your uh, investment can potentially fail. Okay. Grow. We know, we control, uh, we grow. <clears throat> this is a picture of, uh, this is a graph of Dow Jones Industrial Average over the last 30 years. You look at the chart. Huh? All major crashes in the last 30 years or even go back as, as far back as 50 years, okay? It's just a mere blip in the long-term long trend of any properly regulated, healthy stock market. US being one is probably the healthiest because of its uh, very, very high uh, due diligence system, very high... Um, except the specs, like you probably heard of the spec stocks, uh, very high <clears throat> requirement for listings, okay? Show you another chart. Busan, Malaysia, uh, FBM, KLCI, okay, over the last 30 years, there are few crashes here and there, but look at the long-term trend, it's upward sloping. So when I say, don't be afraid to take risk, when you're young, say you started taking risks here when you're 25, sorry, the, the, you're 25, 30. Every month you put in a, a, <clears throat> a 500 bucks, right? So when it is low, you end up with more units, right? Let's say you're buying mutual fund. At this particular point, you'll probably be buying less units because it's expensive, okay? So, at this point, when the market crash, because you are not retiring yet, you still have 20 years to go, right? You should be very happy that the market crashed. Not be deterred, not be, uh, not be scared by the market because you are buying it the cheap. And when you retire, you are here. And when you buy it here, you are and you're buying a lot of units because it's very cheap. See? So this is what we call dollar cost averaging over the entire curve, over the long run. So when you retire at this point, you would have a investment portfolio with the average price substantially lower than your ultimate uh, target. Okay, that is what we mean by uh, using compounded returns, using dollar cost averaging, buy more, uh, buy less when it's high, buy more when it's low to accumulate over a very long term 
This is what I mean by don't be afraid to take risks because when the market crashes, only whatever investment you bought here will probably show a loss, but you don't need the money. In fact, at this point, you are buying more for something substantially higher in the future. Okay. So is retiring with a million a dream? So think again. 100 ringgit savings over the 30 years per month, uh, returning 12%. I think I already showed you, uh, okay, S&P 500 over the last, uh, between this period, uh, this is about 30 years. Uh, yeah, it's about 30 years. Has averaged 11.69%. Okay, so 12% is not a dream. It's not difficult to achieve. It's, it's on the high side, but it's not impossible to achieve. And I'm talking about just S&P 500, you're buying an index, you're not picking stocks, you know? you're not buying Tesla, you're not buying Apple, you're not buying Amazon. You know? You're just buying the average of everything, the 500 top uh, Fortune 500 country uh, uh, company. Okay. And you get your 12%, uh, your 11 over percent. So just 100 ringgit, what, what can you do with 100 ringgit, uh, Faris, in Malaysia? Not really sure. Probably go for a not dinner much, right? with friends. Yeah. yeah not much. So if you, if a group of five friends were to walk into Starbucks, okay, and come out each with a frappuccino, uh, cafe mocha, with maybe a couple of slices of cakes, you know, or pastries and all that, it's already hundred bucks. So hundred bucks is nothing, okay. And for a mere 100 bucks over 30 years, investing like this, oops, sorry. Investing like this will get you 350,000 when you reach six, the year 60, okay? What is 100 bucks? It's nothing, right? So if you increase it into, to 500 bucks is 1.5 million. What is so difficult becoming a, a, a millionaire? It's very, very achievable. It's, it is the discipline. When you promise yourself that month, you're going to put 100 bucks in, you don't put 50 bucks in, right? You don't put 50 bucks in because you overspend that month. That's why it is so important not to overspend. It's so important to budget. Now you see the picture, I'm, I'm coming back to the, I'm telling you why I, I said whatever I said earlier. Thank you. So uh, grow your money unconsciously. When I say unconscious, it's automation. Give the bank an instruction to deduct from there. You know the bank is going to deduct the money. So you will make sure you don't spend the money and keep the money there for the bank to deduct for this particular purpose. Okay. So... Can you envision yourself saving 1,000 ringgit per month after your work for maybe two, three, five years? It's not difficult at all, right? 1,000. 1,000 to grow at S&P 500 sort of rate for 30 years is 3.5 million. Okay, it's 3.5 million. I'm a living testimony, uh, guys. You don't have to dump all these things. I'm a living testimony. I've been doing this for years. And I, yeah, I, I, have, I have quite a few million because I, I have been doing this, okay, investing. The eighth wonder of the world is the power of compounding. You know the power of compounding, right? Okay, every month you compound, it, it snowball, uh, basically it's snowballing, okay, to 3.5 million, only 1,000, okay? This is our fund. Uh, it's called uh, Afin Huang Select Opportunity. I'm just showing you. Uh, I'm not selling to you. <laughs> Today, no sales talk. Okay, uh, 600 over percent over a period of something like 15, 15 years. Uh. So on average, our fund has grown something like 12% also. Okay, you, uh, if, you, if you don't want to invest in the S&P 500 ETF, uh, you, can, you can buy into a fund like this, okay, that is properly managed. Look, what it did in uh, 08, 09, the subprime crisis, it came down also. 
but look at the performance of the fund, it has way surpassed the last low, or it even surpassed the last high. Okay. The last of that uh, subject, protect. Insurance is not something morbid. When an insurance agent, insurance consultant come and talk to you, don't turn them away. They are trying to protect you. <laughs> okay, it is very, very important. Insurance is essentially risk management. You're managing, managing risk in your life. Uh, you probably have seen appeals, you know, the um, people go into, go onto the internet to appeal for uh, GoFundMe, you know, that kind of, that kind of projects. Uh, you don't want to be in that position if, if possible. You don't want to be in, you don't want to be begging money because uh, your husband or your wife uh, meet a, with a car accident and it's totally, totally uh, immobile, right? It cannot work. So the, 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 the person who met with the accident is a sole breed winner and the entire family of four to five, uh, your source of income just suddenly get cut off and you got no choice but to appeal to the public for donation. And how much, how long can you, uh, do you think people can donate uh, to sustain your life? Not very long, like everybody has got their own life to lead, right? Okay, so it is very important. You protect your income, okay, against uncertainty and deterioration. Insurance, you should buy it when you don't need it. When you need it, you would not be able to buy it. Nobody wants to sell to you. Okay, those of you who are in finance major, you study about insurance, it's all about underwriting of risks, right? So if you are perceived to be a high risk factor, insurance company would not want to cover you. They are also a profit maximizing, profit maximizing uh, um, uh, corporation. Insurance companies are not charitable organization. Okay, so they would not want to cover you. You should underwrite your risk if you are perceived to be too risky. Okay, is there another question? Um, yes, we have one question from the audience by Aidila. Will you advise getting a master's, etc., or better to work first? It's better to work first, yeah. Otherwise, you will not be able to relate to the masters. Uh, whatever you do, whatever you learn during the mas your masters program, uh, very likely you can't relate, yeah. And um, I, I just, I, I employ people. I, I run a department and I employ people. Okay, we don't really look at your qualification. That your qualification is important. That gives you a basis that gives you a base layer of knowledge to function as a productive worker. But um, a lot of people has got masters nowadays and they are not very impressive, you know, I have to say, they are not very impressive. Either the college is not training them well, or they go and do a master for the sake of getting the paper qualification, but without the proper um, experience working in the real, uh, real world, so they, when it comes to problem solving and all that, they are actually not any superior than somebody who has uh, a bachelor's, but has been working for, let's say, three, five years. You know, they, they, they have been working for, for a while. They know how to solve problems. Okay. But no, yeah, this is um, not advisable. Uh, if you can work, say, three years, at least about three years, then go back and do your master's that's more, more advisable, yeah. I hope that answer, answer your question, uh, Adila. Adila. Okay. Protect you, buy coverage, not how much you will get in the end. Okay, I, I hope I have got more time to go into this topic because a friend of mine, uh, uh, major in actuary, he taught me a lot of things about insurance. Okay, uh, there's no point buying a endowment or life plan that save you a lot of money. At the end of the term, you get a few tens of thousand back. No, usually those policy are extremely expensive. 
you will probably end up with a very, very low coverage. Remember, insurance is to protect you and your family when you cannot produce. You, you are not productive. Okay. So the savings part, you can invest in stocks, you can invest in funds. Insurance company typically will just give you actual assumption 4% kind of return. Okay, don't go for that. Go for a term life, a term or near term sort of, sort of policy where it, it covers you very, very sufficiently when you are not able to work. Okay, uh, and you, you need only to pay uh, a reasonable, reasonably low premium, okay, on a, on a monthly or a semi-annual or an annual basis, uh, but very, very high coverage. Like in, in my early 30s, I'm recovered up to a million because of, uh, because I understand this concept. Okay, insurance is to protect you, not to help you make money. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a bit idealistic, but uh, it's basically the same calculation as your retirement. If your expenses is 1,000, um, you have to buy a coverage of 400,000. Okay, but in Malaysia, the moment your coverage goes to about a million, they ask a lot of questions already. So to cover up to two, two or five million, uh, that sort of policy is extremely expensive, which is uh, not in Malaysia. It's not quite practical. Okay, if if you if you manage to cover partially or even half, you should be quite happy already in Malaysia. Okay, I talk about that. Okay, I've got another ten minutes. Um, I. Just want to go very, very quickly like, here. Yeah, just take another five minutes. Okay, retirement basically is just not enough. Like, EPF is not enough for your retirement. You need to save up on your own. You need to probably consider buying PRS, private retirement scheme that gives you tax deduction, you know, the kind to, to, to supplement. Uh, Faris, if you have another session next time, if you will do another of this, this sort of webinars and all that, okay, I can share another topic, which is retirement planning with the retirement planning calculator and all that. I did this morning. It was very, very helpful. I mean, everybody liked it, okay? Uh, that is to not, not just to talk. You're not listening to me. I'm guiding you through the process. Every single one of you, go through the calculator to plan to see how much you need for retirement. Uh, taking into consideration um, your EPF deduction, contribution, your the inflation rates, and, and it's a lot more complete. It will give you a much more complete picture than simply taking the money expense divided by, by your FD rates. Uh, that, that is a, actually a very crude cal uh, calculation. Uh, Adila, I know where you're coming from. Just look at this uh, urban household, 86% do not, do not have savings. Okay, and less than 50,000 in your EPF account accounts for 65% of uh, members, you know. So that's huge. A lot of people has, hasn't got money, in, enough money in EPF. But I just show you, right? 1,000, you will save, invest for 12% over 30 years, you get 3.5 million, my God. So where does all this com uh, problem come from? It came from lack of planning. They just never bothered to plan, right? Okay, 65% has got outstanding debt and 50% uh, upon retirement finish their savings in five years. You're gonna live on for another 15 years, right? So who is gonna support you? <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm just gonna skip all this. Just basically on, on retirement, you can choose your lifestyle. I mean, the most miserable thing is after working for 30 over years and during retirement, you have no money and you have to live the life before you, you went to school, right? You, you have to live, go back to the original, very humble beginning, okay? 
having nasi lemak kosong every day. You know, that's, I mean, that's probably the, the worst reward you can give to yourself is after working for 30 over years, upon retirement, income source uh, stops and you have to downgrade your standard of living to punish yourself for the next 20, 20 30 years. Okay, don't do that to yourself. Start to plan for your retirement so that after working for a good 30 years, 35 years, you truly reward yourself with a very good life. Every other, every other month, you go for a nice holiday. You know, you drive a nice car. You, uh, you, you enjoy life. You spend time with all, your, uh, all the friends and uh, colleagues, all the friendship that has built uh, during your working life. You know, you enjoy the quality time with them for the next uh, 20, 30 years. You know, that is retirement. Not the retirement where you have to go to, you have to go back to McDonald's to work. You have to go to McDonald's to work in, uh, in your retirement years. Okay, don't do that to yourself. Okay, inflation is the real thing. You probably read about it. Uh, just give you, I just show you another chart, then I'll call it a day. These are my real colleagues. Uh, we're just using them as example. Uh. Ben started 250, saving 250 ringgit into an account, investing in something that's growing at 8%. That will be your income fund, your balance fund, 50% bond, 50% stock sort of, uh, sort of portfolio. Okay. He starts saving at 25. Then for certain reason, after 10 years, he stopped. Okay. So, but whatever he saved, continue to earn that 8%. Okay. All the way till he's 65. He reaches 65. He ends up with 460,000. Okay. Alexis, she started late. She started 10 years later than Ben. She started saving 250 ringgit per month, investing in 8% over the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years. Same, huh? 30 years. Heightest of 30 years, 10 years savings. Heightest of 30 years. This is solid 30 years of savings. She ended up with 375, less than that. Pay 30 years, you know. Regular savings for 30 years, regular investment of 30 years. She got less than Ben, who started 10 years earlier and stopped, not contributing at all, just let the investment uh, some uh, basically grow at 8% uh, per annum to 65. Okay. Hu Yan, start early, persist all the way. She has got almost triple what Alexis has, 879,000. You see the power of compounding and power, the power of starting very early, allowing time to help you to compound. Let time help you to make your money work harder. So start really, really early. You can start with 50 bucks, right? Okay. 50 bucks is, uh, is, is, the, is the motion of doing it. If you give an instruction to the bank, you wouldn't even bother. I mean, you... you you will just remember, okay, I think one end already, the bank is going to deduct my 50 bucks. I want to make sure there are money inside. All right, okay. Hi, Steve. Can you please yeah. start to wrap up? We're nearing time. Yeah, I'm uh, pretty much done already. The rest are just... I'm not going to talk about PRS. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's probably not... It's not relevant until, until you start working, then you have an income, then you can buy the PRS. You can buy, you can also buy now if you want to, yeah. Let's see, any question? Okay. Yes, Steve, we do have questions on Slido. Melanie, yeah. can you start sharing the screen so Steve can see the questions? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the informative session. So now we'll just move on to the Q&A session due to the yeah. time constraint. All right. Uh, Steve, can you maybe stop sharing? Yeah, oh, thank okay, you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. yeah.
Okay, so here are the questions mm, okay. by participants. What platform can we use to start investing? Any recommended brokerage on how we can invest in S&P 500? Um, we have just started a platform called Allocate Plus. Uh, you go to our website, uh, you search for Allocate Plus, Allocate, uh, Allocation. It is a platform that we just formulated as a is pure online. You can start investing with 50 bucks, 50 ringgit. And the system will guide you, will try to gauge your risk profile, you know, your risk capability, it will ask you a, a few questions here and there, and they will recommend what's your recommend the right in, uh, investment for you. But those are mutual funds, okay? And because it's online, um, it has got virtually, I think zero front end, zero sales charges and all that, but you still have to pay the management fee to the fund manager. But that's transparent to you. It's taken out from the fund. You wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, be able to see it. Yeah. Um, S&P 500, you, if you are patient, you can wait for us because very likely we may launch one. Okay, we don't know yet. Okay, we are trying to see if we can do a S&P 500 from Malaysia. If not, you probably have to uh, sign up one of those E-Trade, uh, Charles Schwab, you know, that sort of accounts with a uh, online broker. Uh, Saxo, Charles Schwab, E-Trade, um, Rakuten, I'm not so sure. Rakuten, I think, is, is only restricted to Malaysia, Malaysian stocks. Okay. Uh, is real estate still a good thing to be investing in? I thought that market is already oversaturated and not increasing in value anymore. Every time government prints money after a crisis, stock market will go up first, followed by uh, real estate. Okay. If you are buying it for speculation, um, you have to be very careful. You are right, Ahmad. The certain segment of the market is very saturated. Uh, office blocks, office and retail. When I say retail, I'm, I'm talking about shop houses are very saturated. Okay. Residential in very prime, very convenient. Uh, let's say along the, the LRT, MRT one, two, three. Uh, along public transportation, those are still very popular and that they can still hold value quite well. Okay, logistic center is doing extremely well. Okay, uh, factory lots that can be converted to logistic center because of all the online trades, you know, the online commerce or e commerce. Um, a lot of merchants um, are renting uh, or logistic centers to uh, to manage their, their merchandise, uh, you know, the, the, the flows, okay? Um, as a fresh grad, what kind of investment should we aim for financial stability? Everybody asks us to buy house first. Is that advisable? Okay, you are, I assume you're a millennia. In fact, millennia are quite open as to not owning house, you know, to actually go long-term on a sharing basis. Okay, um, you buy a house when the price is low. When the rental yield is very, very low for the owner, for say a house owner like me, I rent out my rental yield, I'm getting, I'm getting something at like one over 2% or slightly above 2%. Then what, what the rental yield is saying is, saying is uh, house prices are relatively on the high side. Okay, it is actually more, it makes more sense renting it instead of committing a big sum of for deposits and then subsequently got to pay, right? Uh, in a situation like this, you only want to buy a house if you can see that uh, you expect house prices to increase, to go up the substantially over a long run. If not, when house prices are high, rental yield is low, it makes more sense to rent, not to buy. Okay. Um, what kind of investment should we aim for stability? Uh, I already told you already just now. Uh, invest in slightly higher risk when you're young, slightly higher risk, and do it very regularly, regularly in small bits, bite size. If you can afford 100, just invest 100. If you can do 50, just do 50. If you can do more, just do, five, do 500, 1,000. Okay, and do it religiously over the next 30 years. 
and stare at your 3.5 million uh, 30 years later, you know, have some kind of financial securities. Um, okay. Uh, if we do not have a sustainable income, is it advisable to invest? Are students that hold scholarship advisable to start an investment? Absolutely. If, if you are getting a scholarship and you have extra, the extra, use it to invest. Okay? It's God given. I mean, it's given to you, so make use of it. If you do not have a sustainable income, please also invest, but start very, very small. Okay? Let's say your... your Let's say your income fluctuates between uh, 2,000 to 2,000 to 4,000, you know, and your so-called your extra excess fund fluctuates between, uh, let's say between 200 to 500. This is the extra you have. Some certain month you have 200, certain months you have 500. If this is the case, stick with 200 or 150, slightly lower, but do it religiously for the next 30 years, okay? Due to COVID, uh, I can't scroll down. Huh? Can you scroll down? I can't read the, uh, the question. Ah, due to COVID, most of the people, oops, oh, where's the question? Okay. Due to COVID, most people use up all your savings. We can, uh, how can we start our savings during this pandemic? Use up all your savings. I, you have to look for ways to, you have to look for ways to increase your income. Do a part-time job, take up a hobby, or do something about it. Okay. Uh, there, there are no two ways about it, unfortunately. You need to have access. Otherwise, you cannot start a plan. If you cannot start a plan, you don't know, you don't know whether you're going to retire, retire penniless, or you're going to retire with all your rich friends, okay? Uh, together with all your rich friends. Uh, do you advise we get a personal financial advisor to manage our funds? For your age, um, I, would, I would really want to do my own homework, okay? I really want to do my homework. Go and read up. There are just so much resources on the internet, okay? Just go to Google and say, type financial, financial planning. Uh, how to invest. Uh, you know, go to Motley Fool, M-O-T-L-E-Y, Fool, F-O-O-L. Motley Fool is for beginners. It's a very, very resourceful website to teach beginners how to invest in all sorts of instruments. And also, there are a lot of lessons regards to personal finance on Motley Fool. Okay. And uh, Motley Fool is just one of them. There are many, you know. Investopedia, the lookup for terms. Um, there are a lot of, on EDX or Udemy, there are a lot of causes about investment. There are a lot of causes on, uh, on uh, personal finance. Okay, in fact, I asked my daughter to actually take up the uh, online course from a very, very reputable university. I think it's from University of Chicago or something like that. You know? And, and it's, it's free, you know. Is, is, there's just so much resources. So do your own homework first before you uh, engage a personal financial advisor, okay? So that you would know when the personal financial advisor is BSing you, okay? Yeah. If you don't have sustainable income, is it advisor invest, a student host? Uh, yeah, I already answered this question, yeah. I hope I answer your questions, okay, guys? Yeah, thank you everyone for your questions. For now, we'll move on to the photo shoot session. So um, if you don't mind, uh, we would like to encourage you to turn on your webcam for us to take a picture. Okay. I'll wait a few more seconds. You're going to project to the whole screen, right, Melanie? <laughs> mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a few more people are still 
on you. Yeah. Um, oh, Adila, I'm, okay. I see you finally. You ask you ask a few questions. <laughs> I hope I answer your questions. Okay. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, on my count, mm -hmm. three, two, one. Okay, thank you. Right. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I hope you guys learned something. Uh, I hope there are some takeaways uh, today. And uh, yeah. good luck to your studies and good luck to life. Uh, if you want to hear yeah. about retirement planning, more detail, uh, talk to Faris. Uh, can arrange to come on for another session when, when you guys uh, have another session, another event. So um, unfortunately, this event has come to an end. Mm. So we would like to thank everyone today for joining us and we hope that you have gained valuable knowledge. So here's a reminder to all participants that we will be holding our next sessions on the dates as listed. Wait, let me share the... Okay, so here are the dates for the next second and third session about investment and fintech respectively. So do join all these sections to get your certificate of participation. And before you leave, do fill out this feedback form for improvement. So once again, on behalf of NMSG Academy, thank you and we see you next time. Thank you, bye, thanks. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Have a good day. Yeah, you too.